Um, our panelists will share today how they encourage such practices in their day-to-day -day work. So let me now introduce our moderator, Tim Hanstead, the CEO of the Chandler Foundation. Um, Tim has been the CEO for a few years now. Before leading Chandler Foundation, he co-founded Landessa, which an organization many of you know. He co-founded it with Roy Prosterman, and he built it from a two-person operation to a major human rights NGO. He's a Schwab social entrepreneur and also an awardee of the Skoll, of the Skoll Foundation, the Skoll Social Entrepreneur Award. And we're really excited. He's been a great member of our steering group for the initiative and very excited to have him moderating today. So Tim, over to you. Thank you, Heather. And thank you to, to RPA and to the Skoll Foundation. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so honored to uh, and excited to be with you today for this discussion on this really important topic. Um, I come to this discussion, as Heather said, having spent more than 30 years as a social entrepreneur. And um, in that role, I gained insights on what I found to be both great and, and not so great donor behavior and practices, and also insights on some of the structural problems with the overall funding system. And in the last two and a half years leading the Chandler Foundation and working as part of several collaborations, trying to make philanthropy more effective, that includes Co-Impact, this uh, Scaling Solutions Toward Shifting Systems Initiative, um, Catalyst 2030 and others, I, I continue to learn. But of course, learning is, is not enough. I mean, as, as Farhad Ibrahimi articulated yesterday in another session, the information deficit approach to changing philanthropy is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need to turn learning into action. We need to change practices, but more importantly, we need to change mindsets, paradigms, power dynamics, and feedback loops. And I am delighted today to have this opportunity to gain insights from our terrific panel and from all of you in the audience too, on how we, particularly we as, as philanthropic donors, can move along our learning and action journey to better support transformational systems level impact. So here's how we're gonna spend our time today. We'll start with a moderated discussion with our panelists. And during that time, I encourage you to submit questions for our panelists using the chat function. As we'll follow the moderated discussion by presenting questions from you, the audience. And then we're gonna move into breakout rooms for smaller working group discussions where you all will have an opportunity to provide whiteboard input on key questions. And after the breakout sessions and time permitting, we'll have another short Q&A session with our panelists before wrapping up. Okay, let's move to our great panel. It represents a rich variety of experiences and perspectives, um, both geographically and across the donor uh, doer uh, continuum. We have two foundation leaders, both of whom moved to the donor world, having had substantial experience as leaders of doer organizations. We have Don Chen, who is president of the Thirdna Foundation, where he leads this 100-year-old foundation's efforts to strengthen and further leverage its commitment to social justice. Don spent many years at the Ford Foundation. He also has years of doer experience as a founder and longtime CEO of Smart Growth America, a policy advocacy organization. We're also delighted to have Jen Ching, who is executive director of North Star Fund, whose work is focused on participatory equity-centered grant making. Prior to her four and a half years at North Star, Jen was a leader of organizations working on legal services and on policy advocacy in the education and equity space. Jen's previous work as a lawyer includes representing Guantanamo Bay prisoners held after 9-11. Our next panelist comes squarely from the doer side. Ari Johnson is co-founder and CEO of Muso, an NGO working in Mali and Cote d'Ivoire to end the child and maternal mortality crises and help create universal health coverage at scale. And last but not least, our panel includes two leaders of donor networks, one network in Asia, another in Africa. And each of these leaders is, is both leading a nonprofit organization that needs to raise funds, but also whose membership consists of donors giving, which gives them interesting perspectives on today's topic. 
Mosun Layorde is the executive director of Africa Philanthropy Forum. And Mosun works across the continent with established and emerging philanthropists who are committed to a sustainable and inclusive development in Africa. And then Naina Subarwal Batra is the CEO of the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, AVPN, a regional funder network aiming to increase the flow of financial, human, and intellectual capital for impact. So you can see we have a great panel and I'm just gonna jump into it now and feature them. I'm gonna start with you, Jen. Do our organizations can sometimes view donor organizations as monolithic, um, but of course, philanthropic institutions can have their own uh, internal consensus spaces, including where the staff and the governing bodies may have differing views. Have you found that to be true? And what do you think is needed to bring governing or leadership bodies to come around to funding in ways that support transformational impact? Thank you so much um, for including me and Northstar Fund in today's conversation. And I really wanna say, Tim, I think this is such an important moment to be asking this very question. Um, you know, uh, it's really great to see so many people here from around the world, uh, you know, and I believe we're all here today because we have a fairly collective sense of urgency, whether brought on by the climate crisis or the deep disparities exposed by the COVID crisis or the political mainstream resurgence of white supremacy movements or the, you know, unending and deepening chasm of wealth inequality. Like, there are so many conversations addressing all these questions and more at this forum. But what I love about today and today's particular conversation is that we're asking the heavy question, which is who's paying for this transformational work and why aren't more of us doing so? Um, and so, you know, one thing that I have to say is that it's very hard to talk about trends in philanthropy, right? It's very hard to make generalizations about such an opaque um, and protected sector. It's by definition, it's private and largely unregulated. And, you know, I think the saying goes, right, if you've met one foundation, if you've met one donor, you've met one donor, you've met one foundation, right? Um, but nonetheless, I think there are a number of very large questions currently um, being reflected in the philanthropic sector. And Tim, as you say, the doer donor distinction really is, the, is that core one that is causing a lot of high level and all level conversations. Foundations now are generations into bringing on staff who tend to be practitioners, right, who come in having just a hot minute ago been a grantee and have real ideas about ways that money should move. Um, family foundations, right, we're experiencing the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth right now in this generation. So many differences in thinking about how money moves based on the proximity to the work that the foundation may or may not support. And on a more granular level, right? I mean, you know, giving is public, giving is private, right? Parents disagreeing with children about the sources of structural barriers to change and what transformational impact really can look like. And so there's a lot of opportunities to be having this conversation right now uh, within the philanthropic sector, and in particular around how do we bring governing bodies towards funding ways, as you asked him, that support transformational impact. And I really think that this question um, and the answer boils down to three things. Um, the first that I would say is that it boils down to thinking about how we feel. Governing bodies and donors, we need to recognize and embrace discomfort with change. I always say, if you are comfortable with systemic change, then you are not actually changing systems, right? Um, we need to leave behind the idea that giving exists for us to feel good and only good, and we have to reframe our work around interconnected features, huh? right? There's we lost quite the table a bit this of um, whoops, We just need folks to, to mute. Um, there's quite a bit of analysis right now about the nature of the COVID crisis, right? The, the market economy is booming on. Corporate interest in the U.S. in particular have been largely protected through these very large-scale legislated aid packages. The U.S. is using its buying and its bullying power to secure vaccines at the expense of other nations. What it shows us is that even in the time of crisis, the status quo is really about maintaining the status quo. And so to invest in structural change, as philanthropists, we have to deepen our understanding that structural barriers exist right, and that our sector has been a longtime arbiter of harm as well as good, but understanding and learning the history of philanthropy and its role as the protector of the status quo within racialized capitalism, within global economic systems, that leads us to ask different questions of our governing bodies, namely, 
asked, how is our work actually eradicating structural racism as opposed to incrementally improving individual circumstances? And how do we actually transfer this into the work that we are funding as structural and systems shift? And so that the second and third thing that I think is essential for us for governing bodies is governing bodies must expand who we listen to. So we have to be thinking about how we feel and embracing discomfort with change. We have to expand who we listen to. We must open our institutions and ourselves to different voices and to give these voices real power, not just um, come to a meeting and tell us what you think, but real power in setting dis- setting strategies and decisions. And many times when I talk to foundation leaders and trustees, they will say to me, well, you know, we did a survey and our grantees reported they're quite happy with the way that we fund them and what we do. But we all know that there's a power dynamic there, right? When when a recipient of funds is asked to reflect on, you know, what changes they would like to see, I I don't know that honesty is going to be the first practice that we draw on, right? Um, But nonetheless, you know, there are tons of independent nonprofit survey sectors out there, NGO surveys, that all say the same thing. The sector deeply underfunds grassroots work led by um, communities most impacted by injustice, and the sector deeply underfunds systems change. And that in response, grantees want flexibility in funding, multi-year deep investments to be able to pursue this work. So we hear it in coming from the independent side of the sector, but we sort of want to always hear what we want to hear. We want to feel good about what we're giving, but what we're, what we're giving is not listening to, to, um, to our constituency. And if we were really in any other sector, right, any other business, we would change, have changed course immediately because our constituencies would have been telling us to change course. And so the third thing, so in addition to how we feel and who we listen to, is just in what we fund. That transformational impact requires us to fund transformational work. And that doesn't mean that it's purely linked to like size and scale, right? We all have different size levers and points of intervention to make change. Very local victories around structural change are the building blocks of wide reaching transformation. And so we have to be willing to fund this work at all levels and in different ways. And we really have to be willing to fund work that is building power and building power led by the people who are most impacted by the injustices that we purport to address. Um, And so the first step in doing this work, I think, is having and introducing these conversations within your institution, being willing to talk across difference, to be wrong, to course correct, to experiment, to take risks, to move quickly and with intention, right? All of these things are not in the typical comfort zone of philanthropic um, settings. And that's not an indictment on philanthropy. All of these traits are are not typical traits for when we come to spend money in any setting. But we have to ask questions about who and what are we funding? What is the decision making and the leadership building model of the organizations we're supporting? Who is designing the solutions that um, that the organization is advancing? And is the organization building a base and bringing more people into their work? Structural change is not just about a hot new idea from a you know a whiz kid, right? It's about interrupting centuries of entrenched power structures and will require funding to dismantle these structures at a very core level. That is deeply uncomfortable to me. It should be deeply uncomfortable to all of us. But what I recommend for us is that we tie that discomfort to that understanding that we have interconnected futures. And so when I start thinking about what am I funding for, what am I funding for towards my children's future, I feel braver, I feel bolder. And I think that feeling is what can move us forward as philanthropy. Wow, Jen, so great. Um, Three very practical uh, things there about um, expanding who we listen to, um, think about how we feel and and lean into discomfort and and think about who we're funding and what we're funding. Um, Mosun, I wanna move to you. And uh, I imagine that your your network of, of African philanthropists, there's a variety of places where those philanthropists are in terms of funding transformational impact. Have you seen changes over the time that you've been working with them? And, and if so, what, what has kind of caused or prompted philanthropists to, to move in a direction to, to fund more transformational impact? Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you for having me for this important conversation. Good morning, good Afternoon, good evening to you from wherever you're joining. Um, I'm I'm really excited to be part of this conversation because 
systems change is, is at the core of, of our work at the African Philanthropy Forum um, at, at the moment. It's, it's at the front burner for us. And in terms of working with with our network. And, and for those who are not familiar with the African Philanthropy Forum, we're a network of philanthropists and social investors that are committed to doing good on the African continent. Um, and we've, we've been around since 2014, um, established by the Global Philanthropy Forum based in California, but we became an independent entity in 2017, fully governed by an African board um, and registered in Nigeria and in South Africa. So we have a variety of, of members within our network. And, and as Tim mentioned, we have them in, in various growth traje trajectories, if I'll put it that way. Um, and I would say with regards to um, the, the position um, between staff and, and governing bodies, for, for what we're seeing um, in, in, in our member organizations or um, you know, with, with um, community foundations that are within our network, we find that um, it's more of a symbiotic relationship um, where the, the governing body, the board relies on the staff um, for information that they're getting from the ground up um, because they are closest to the communities. And so they would, typically rely on the feedback that they are receiving to enable the board give direction and you know, provide guidance in the way um, funds are being deployed in, in the various communities. And, and the, the beauty of this is we're beginning to see trans transformational impact on the continent. It's slow, um, but it's, it's gaining traction. And the reason this is happening in particular um, is because for members of our community that are more established than, um, than the others. And you, so we have um, within our network, those who are aspiring philanthropists, we have those who are emerging philanthropists, we have those who are established philanthropists that have been doing this for over 25 years. And you know, th this core group um, of, of those who have been in this space for a longer period are beginning to to approach um, change in the society or in our communities with a long-term view. And they are gravitating towards collaborating to solve root causes um, because they have been in the space for long enough to understand that we cannot continue to solve problems the way we always have because we're continuing to deal with the same issues over and over again. So rather than deal with symptoms and serve as service providers, it's important that we begin to shift our thinking um, and and address the issues we have at the root causes. And hello? Okay, no, I thought I got caught off there. And so this, this started pre-pandemic, you know, but I, I always tell people that the pandemic is a mixed blessing, at least from where I'm from where I'm sitting. Um, it, it really has opened up fault lines in our communities and it's you know it's really magnified the deep-seated issues that we have. Um, with regards to how, how we address problems in, in, in across the African continent. And so this has further emphasized the need for us to shift our thinking and apply system thinking in order um, to, to have transformational impact on the continent. I mean, in the immediate term, um, it wouldn't look like there is um, anything happening that is shifting systems because we have to be responsive. Um, we have to be agile. We're seeing our members you know, just get in front of the issue, providing funding. Um, they became less restrictive in the way they were funding around the time of the pandemic. You know, just the, the focus was to just get the get funds to those who require it and, and get support to the frontline workers in, so that we can reduce the impact of the pandemic. And the it, it's interesting um, because we in the time of Ebola, we saw this happening as well. Um, we saw philanthropists rallying around an issue, and we saw a lot of collaboration happening across, across sectors. And this already put in some systems and structures in place. Um, for instance, like the emergency operation centers that were put in place at about the time of Ebola that came in handy um, when, when the COVID um, pandemic struck. You know, but then again, we cannot continue to address um, 
issues when they arise. And, and that's why we have to have this conversation around systems change. Um, and it's, it's important um, for members of our community at this time because they are the ones that um, they, are, they have flexible funding and they are able to they're able to test ideas, they're able to support pilot innovations in, in communities um, and get behind issues that others may not readily get behind. You know? So we're beginning to see um, a lot of shift towards um, longer term impact or, or long, long view approaches to solving problems um, in, our, in our communities, in, in the APF community. Great, thanks, Mosin, and it's uh, encouraging that you're seeing progress uh, within your network around longer term perspectives, around a more systemic mindsets. Um, and let's hope that however the pandemic has, it may have accelerated those that we won't return back uh, once, once the pandemic is, is over. Um, Nana and Dawn, I wanna turn to you. I've got a question. Um, I'd like the same question I'd like to pose to both of you, and it's about examples of kind of good, good practices or good grants. I, I know when I was leading Landessa, I got some, we got some great grants and, uh, that were multi-year, you know, long-term, what, what Vule calls the my God, right? Multi-year general operating dollars. You've all heard that. Shout out to Vule. Um, we actually got a grant that was 10 years unrestricted. So what I'd like to hear from, from each of you, and I'll go to you first, Nana, and then to Don. Um, give me a story of a difference a good grant or funding practice has made, um, and, or, or a bad one, or, or maybe both. So first to you, Nana. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you very much uh, for having me on this uh, amazing discussion. Um, I agree with you. I mean, you know, sort of unrestricted grants are, uh, are really sort of, or blue sky grants are, are worth their weight in gold or more. And especially for, um, and I'm sure Mosun will agree, for organizations like the ones we run, which are, you know, infrastructure building organizations, which anyway struggle to get grants. So unrestricted grants are, are even more hard to come by. And I'll, I'll give you a personal example from AVPN, which actually is an unrestricted grant we got from uh, the Economic Development Board of Singapore, which is a government body. And we've had unrestricted funding from them since uh, bef before we set up in 2012. And, um, and, and they've, they've been transformational from that time onwards because they've actually let AVPN go beyond what you know, you would think a network of funders could actually do. It's let us imagine how we can structure the philanthropy landscape across Asia. It's let us examine thorny issues that, uh, you know, others have kind of been wary of, of taking forth. It's also let us, um, you know, sort of uh, develop and, uh, and launch new initiatives and practices that wouldn't have existed, I would like to think. So for instance, how do you get policymakers to come in and fund together with private sector funders? How do you actually um, look at bringing in the doers onto a funders, what is essentially a funders platform by setting up a, a deal share network where actually um, the doer organizations can reflect projects and themselves to funders to say, hey, this is something interesting I'm doing and you know, why don't you fund me? Or, and not, not have them pitch, but have funders who have funded them actually um, represent their case. Um, but more recently, and you know, when, when Jen was speaking, um, I mean, thank you, Jen, so much for your comments because I think they resonated across geography for me. Because if you look at what is happening, not just in the United States, you know, in, in terms of looking at justice, looking at privilege. But if you look at what's happening across the world, you know, the, the space for civil society, the space for the doers is shrinking and especially shrinking where I am here in Asia. 
whether you look at the massive economies in, in, in China or in India or in Hong Kong, everywhere you go, you're finding that uh, the ability to have free speech, the ability for the nonprofit sector to exist without regulation, the ability for the voices least heard to come to the table is just shrinking. And what we are finding is that philanthropy, I mean, you know, Jen, what you said resonated so strongly. Philanthropy is not taking, not, not really using its voice, not really using its catalytic power to make a difference. And when organizations get unrestricted funding, that is the power that you give them. That is the power that you give them to speak up without being scared, to actually take a stand, to go out there and be a I would say be a, a supporter of those who need it the most. And, and you know, that's the, that's the transformative power of philanthropy. And that is what I will tell every funder who is on this call that please wake up. This is why you have that money to make a change, to make a difference. And you have to do it right now. So, you know, giving unrestricted funding to your beneficiary organization allows them to be brave. Let them have that power to be brave. Thanks, Nana, for your characteristic boldness and, and urgency about how, how funders should act. Don, over to you, same question. Well, I'll just build on what Nana said about uh, unrestricted uh, grant funding and the My God uh, acronym, which I think is, in, is, is uh, absolutely memorable and, and valuable. Um, to say that that is uh, something that I think more of us regard as an important part of the future of philanthropy. Um, and I'll just tell a little bit, uh, uh, share a couple examples from my uh, experience uh, that span the gamut. Um, years prior to joining the philanthropy sector, um, as Tim mentioned, I spent nearly two decades raising money for uh, small nonprofits. Uh, and I've worked with virtually every type of funder, um, including funders who were very controlling and thought that they, they could use their small grant to treat grantees like staff people and call the shots and uh, impose very onerous burdens on everything from grant applications and the program work to grant reporting. And, and that's a really terrible experience for grantees. Um, and at the same time, I've been lucky enough to receive long-term unrestricted grant funding uh, from a lot of foundations, even before that became more of a, uh, uh, more regarded as a good practice. Um, I'll cite one example from the 1990s when I was early in my career. Um, I came up in the environmental justice movement in the United States. And so a lot of my work has been very intersectional, uh, spanning various different issues and different levels of uh, government, uh, different types of constituents. And so it was always um, my work putting together uh, unlikely allies and trying to organize and organize and organize to make change. And in the 1990s in the United States, uh, the challenges that many of us were facing were uh, one, one, one major challenge was the fact that many cities were dealing with population decline um, and property abandonment uh, and uh, extreme poverty and disinvestment. And the result was uh, uh, community members uh, in cities like Cleveland and Detroit and Buffalo, New York, uh, uh, experiencing high levels of poverty. Uh, also just neighbors experiencing danger uh, in their communities. There was the spread of HIV AIDS through drug use in abandoned buildings. Uh, there were parents concerned about their children injuring themselves uh, in abandoned structures. Um, neighbors who are trying desperately to preserve their neighborhoods, city officials trying to retain tax base, um, civil rights groups uh, working really hard to uh, retain neighborhood character because a lot of these negative effects were affecting people of color, especially African-Americans. And so these were all very different constituencies. And in trying to come up with solutions uh, to these problems, uh, we recognize that um, a lot of funders wouldn't have that very intersectional set of things neatly scoped in their grant making guidelines. Um, and so uh, we made the case um, to talk about uh, the, the fact that we had all these activists toiling in isolation on their 
different issues in their different communities. And there was a need to try to um, organize and build some movement infrastructure, if you will, some networking, some uh, capacity to, to convene people and, and really rely on those most proximate to the problems to come up with solutions um, to, to uh, real challenges like Wall Street backed investors swooping in to purchase, you know, dozens and dozens of property uh, properties in a neighborhood without necessarily caring at all about what happened to that neighborhood. They just wanted to get their money back and flip the properties and get out. Um, and so the exciting thing for us was that we happened to uh, appeal to some funders who uh, were based in some of these cities, like the Mott Foundation uh, and, and even the Ford Foundation, which was based in New York City, um, recognized uh, this as a national problem and, and other funders um, who uh, decided to take a chance on us and um, gave us long-term general support. And it was an absolute game changer. Um, so, you know, that, that's my experience uh, in terms of how uh, we were able to take something that seemed like a very long shot, not necessarily appealing to conventional philanthropy um, and make something of it only because we had the ability, you know, we didn't have an agenda because we were, we wanted to work with local communities and residents uh, to try to shape an agenda together. Um, and uh, uh, they took a chance and, and ended up funding that effort for quite a long time. Today, it's, uh, it, it's manifested in an organization called the Center for Community Progress that has a big national network that focuses on those issues. Um, and just to pull back a little bit, I would say some of the key lessons there uh, were that um, I think over the decades, foundations have shifted. Uh, if, if you all have studied philanthropy in the United States uh, during the last century, in the, in the mid-century uh, period, uh, a lot of big funders in particular saw themselves as hiring experts and then uh, having those experts de devise very elaborate, ambitious pilot programs, social programs and whatnot, with the expectation that success would be picked up by governments that would then scale those models and then you know, implement them in government programs. Um, that approach you know, led to a lot of problems and, and sometimes disastrous results. Um, there were some successes as well, but you know, it was very top-down approach. Um, then there were, uh, you know, several decade period, which I think we're still in, where foundations started hiring doers, as Tim called us at the at the beginning of this conversation. And I, I certainly count myself as one of those. And so, you know, foundations started hiring activists and, and, uh, uh, and I think that has been an improvement, but I would argue that it's not enough because foundations tend to be uh, an echo chamber. Uh, the sector is an echo chamber, uh, which is an environment in which you only hear from people who agree with you. And the longer people spend in philanthropy, the more isolating the echo chamber becomes. And so uh, to quote my friend uh, Farhad Ibrahimi, who spoke, I believe, yesterday at Skoll uh, World Forum, um, I think the, the future of philanthropy is to really provide resources to people who are closest to the problems because they have such a powerful sense of what the solutions to local problems should be. Um, and uh, we, we, as foundations, we need to really listen to folks on the front lines of social change. And even more importantly, uh, I see an opportunity for foundations to uh, do more sharing of our decision-making power and control, um, to invite community members to the decision-making table uh, so that we can do uh, these types of, um, provide these, this type of funding support collaboratively. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, that that is embodied in uh, a trend today that we we now call trust based philanthropy, um, where funders are more trusting uh, of these close relationships with um, grantees with people in the community. Uh, and I hope that that's a, a trend that continues to gain traction and become stronger as we go forward. So those are a couple of things that I would observe and, and offer. Great, thanks so much, Don, and thanks um, for sharing your experience with with this group. I know uh, I saw a lot of heads nodding when you talked about echo chambers, when you talked about uh, trust-based philanthropy and about the importance of sharing decision-making. 
and control with uh, with communities, those who, who suffer most from the problems we're trying to address. Um, Ari, I'm gonna turn to you. Your, your work with, with Muso is in deep relationship with community partners. How have the relationships between donor and community partners shaped Muso's path from, from founding and into this time of increased visibility of, of racial health and economic injustices? And, and have your grant seeking or partnership processes changed during that time? Why and why or why not? Tim, thank you. And what an honor to be here with all of you. Um, so when I arrived in Mali 16 years ago, a uh, Harvard trained American, uh, I thought I had some solutions to offer, but boy, was I wrong. Um, fortunately, Musa was founded by a group of Malians and Americans. And the very first thing that we did was to move in with those who we sought to serve, to actually become uh, neighbors to our patients um, and to engage our patients as partners and particularly as our professors um, to learn from our patients. Uh, so our patients uh, gently taught us that um, I hadn't just gotten the solution wrong. I had fundamentally misunderstood the problem. I came in thinking as many uh, in global health and development too, in terms of individual diseases. Uh, malaria is a leading cause of illness and death where we work. So let's create a malaria prevention and treatment program. But our patients showed us that from their perspective, they didn't have a malaria problem. They had a problem with unjust healthcare systems designed to exclude them because of the color of their skin, because of where they lived, because they were poor to delay their access to care uh, for any illness. So they explained to us that, that the problem at the root came down to, uh, in practice, fees they couldn't afford to pay and distance they could not afford to travel. And in doing so, our patients mapped the blueprints of what would become our work for more than a decade. And I am so grateful that they did because, because of that, the communities that Musa serves, now 16 years later, have achieved outlier results. Our government partners have committed to making that kind of outlier change happen nationally as well. Uh, in 2018, a study in the British Medical Journal of Global Health documented how our community partners have achieved a more than tenfold increase in access to care. Our community partners uh, who uh, had previously faced some of the world's highest rates of child death have now achieved rates of child mortality lower than that of any country in Sub-Saharan Africa for five years running. But listen, let me tell you, all of this almost did not happen. Because unfortunately, I was not alone coming in with some potentially dangerous misconceptions. Before we launched our first proactive healthcare system, there was only a single major American funder ready to fund it with one big catch. Though they came from a government that spends more than $10,000 per American per year on healthcare, they told us that spending $20 per Malian per year on healthcare was unsustainable, as too costly, and that we needed to cut costs by charging patients fees, even though our patients told us that those very fees were killing their children and were driving them into poverty. And by the way, our patients had uh, research backing them up on that. Uh, so we believe, no, we knew that if we took that funding, we would be participating in a racist system, one that values the lives of our patients, not a little bit less, but orders of magnitude less than the lives of white Americans. So Musso, at that point, uh, we had to make a frankly terrifying decision to turn down that funding our only major funding prospect at the time. And the first years that followed that, they were hard. We ran on fumes. Uh, there were many points that we were just weeks away from completely running out of cash in those first years because we made that decision, right? Fortunately, we eventually found our way to connect with a group of philanthropists committed to doing things very differently. Folks like members of the Big Bank Philanthropy Group 
and folks like our partners at USAID's Development Innovation Ventures. So it's because we've had this kind of support that the kind of out of the box solutions that our patients mapped out for us became real. It's because we had that kind of support that we were able to vet that solution with rigorous research to really test it. Um, and any of these extraordinary results, the outlier change, the transformation that we've witnessed led by the communities we serve, that's because we had this kind of support uh, to solve a solution to a problem that none of us saw coming. Wow, thanks, Ari, and I can only imagine the, uh, the, the challenges and the difficulty of saying no to funding that way, I think it came up in a in the session yesterday, where someone uh, said, and it might have been far hot again about it, that it's possible to fund the right things the wrong way, and um, I I I just think that's so true. And and having more social purpose organizations with with the courage to say no to funders who are funding the right things the wrong way. Um, would be great. We we are running behind, and uh, we had uh, thought we'd have maybe a few more questions. For wow, that was I don't know about y'all, but we had some great input discussion in our breakout room. I, I expect that you did as well. Um, as was mentioned, RPA will be gathering all of that input that you just provided and using it to inform the the future work of of the scaling solutions towards shifting systems initiative. We have about 20 minutes left, and I want to actually move to some of the, the questions that were uh, from the audience that were provided earlier. Um, so Can you still see them, Tim? Um, for example, there was one about um, donor, uh, boards and trustees, and how do we get them to change at that level? Go ahead, go ahead, Heather. You, you, if you've got it in front of you, want to read it and direct it. I don't have it in front of me, but I do know there was a question about how can we change the way people are working at that level. So I wonder if any of the speakers can talk to that one. I'll, I'll put them in the chat again for you, Tim. Thanks. Anyone on the panel want to tackle that one? Jen? I'm happy to share a few experiences because actually um, North Star Fund is here in this conversation today at the invitation of one of our institutional supporters, Don and Serdna. And Serdna's philanthropic practice is supporting North Star Fund's work to work directly with donors and boards about these very questions. Um, and so I, I think just a, a couple things. First of all, there are a number of programs now um, available to boards and trustees to bring outside facilitators into these spaces and actually have and lead uh, very difficult and but transformative conversations, usually starting first around the questions I spoke about earlier about introducing and coming to a baseline understanding about structural inequity and in particular structural racism and why um, foundations are comfortable, for example, pursuing and thinking about building a diverse staff, but really um, finding it very challenging to hold and, and internalize these conversations into the, the structural underpinnings of the foundation itself. So, um, you know, high recommend, I can drop some um, resources in the chat, but there are a lot of spaces, including at our foundation, where people come together as a place of praxis, as I said earlier, to start learning about the history of, of philanthropy. We are not used to talking about philanthropy itself as a system. And I saw so many comments in the chat when we were talking before, right? We, we individualize philanthropy in the same way that we individualize philanthropy's work, right? It's all about like separate families making decisions or separate foundations. Everyone's working on their own in their own little silos, but we are actually a significant system in of itself, including, you know, and, and, and growing in assets as you look at the donor advice funds and what's happening, right? So individual giving, institutionalized giving, right? It all comes together. And so it's good for people to kind of learn about those systems. Systems. Um, 
There's a national program called the Giving Project uh, Community National Network, which is designed to bring together people to introduce the practice of philanthropy um, through a race equity lens and, and, and then to also for participants to actively fundraise for their local community. So that's one thing that really often changes how philanthropists and trustees feel about work is when they actually have to fundraise. When we have to fundraise, we really change our tune about what we think <laughs> funders should do. And that sort of practice and praxis, I think, can really change, um, can be the part of, of change. Great. Thanks, Jen. And you mentioned um, DAFs in your response. There was a question about, <clears throat> um, interested in hearing from panelists how we might leverage or advocate for greater access to DAFs for the sake of deeper, broader grant making. So much philanthropic capital is parked in DAFs. Is anyone leading the charge to tap into these funds for uh, the size slash scope of investment? And any one of our panelists want to take that on? Or Heather. Um, I guess what I would say about that there, I see uh, looking at the chat, what I see about DAFs is um, I think some people think that it's less than what foundations are giving because foundations have the legal 5%, but DAF money is actually going out at higher than 5%. I think it's averaging something like 15 or 20%. But of course there was the explosion in DAFs when the tax law changed at the end of, I think, 2018. So what all I would say is I can commit from our initiative to look at that a bit more because we actually haven't looked at that at all. So access to DAFs and um, you know how to get orient that more towards systems change work. I'm curious if any of if any of our panelists get funding from individuals who are giving through DAFs. Well, I'll just say that I, I'm not very familiar with uh, DAFs because we don't really work directly with um, with them, but. Uh, there is an effort uh, and actually several efforts to try to um, reform the philanthropic sector, including the way DAFs work. Uh, and so there are a number of policy proposals out there. Some very high profile foundation people have come out as recently as a few months ago, um, calling on more transparency and accountability and, and whatnot. So I think those are good trends, um, but I gotta admit, I'm not deeply familiar with um, with how all of those conversations are, are uh, transpiring. I think we're in a very unique time right now in the United States in particular, just in our current political atmosphere where there is the potential opportunity to advance some longstanding proposed legislation around regulating DAF, um, you know, the sort of charity stimulus world, encouraging giving. Um, and I think these are real questions for because what's happening with the DAFs is not, and I appreciate what people are saying that DAFs on the whole have a larger, um, you know, more percentages are giving, you know, like, so why are we focusing on that? I, what the challenge is that DAFs are far more opaque than even foundations. So they can be anonymous, um, that the giving is not tracked, the giving is, is sitting in the investment funds and not in entities that have, for example, even to file form 990s, right? So, um, so from a, philanthropic from a nonprofit sector, oftentimes you can receive money from DAFs. You don't know where it's from. You have no relationship. It comes as a check from Fidelity. Um, and so the whole business of nonprofit fundraising is about building relationships with the people who are supporting you. But if you receive a check that says you don't know how long, if you'll get it again, and it comes from something called the Donkey Tree Fund at Fidelity, you have no idea of where you can't plan on this money coming again. You don't know. So Community foundations like North Star Fund, we are actually DAF holding institutions. And one of the things that we do at North Star Fund and in a number of funds with similar values to us is that we actually set some restrictions and some expectations for the donors who participate through us, including that they need to spend down their DAFs. Um, they need to uh, be, you know, uh, to not practice anonymity. Um, they need to adhere to a certain set of social justice principles, you know. And so I think a lot of this is about our ability to organize ourselves and for us as for peers who have leverage in our sector to take responsibility and to encourage and more transparency and better practices. Because otherwise, um, you know, as I said, as a recipient of, 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 of these checks that come from literally, you know, out of sp outer space, 
there's no way for nonprofits to, to plan or in any way kind of really build a meaningful relationship with the philanthropic sector. Great. There was a, a question about participatory grant making. Um, and I, I want to make this open for any of the panelists who wanted to um, talk about what have you seen as some of the most uh, effective participatory approaches in setting funder strategies in meaningful ways? I would say the North Star Fund. <laughs> And I'm serious. I, you know, it, to me, it, it's the reason why I think Jen is here, uh, because uh, I think the North Star Fund has really been uh, walking the the talk uh, about how to do participatory grant making with people in communities for years, long before long before it was, um, you know, something that became fashionable uh, in the field to talk about. So I'm just going to turn it back over to Jen. I have spoken so much and my and my small group also heard me talking about it. I mean, I think the challenge with participatory grant making and our group, our small group really lifted this is that it's actually a bucket um, name for a huge number of different things, right? It's about bringing perhaps outsiders onto a board. It's about um, t tweaking or changing decision making. Um, but when we talk about participatory grant making, we are really talking about grant making that shifts power to the people who are most proximate to the challenges that the foundation seeks to address. But, but you know, as, as Don says, there's a number of kind of different ways that foundations and other giving spaces are practicing um, shared decision making or um, spaces to build that muscle. And, you know, I think there are a lot of models. And I will have to say North Star Fund. We may be a model within the United States, but our methodology really comes from internationally rooted spaces that what we practice as participatory grant making here in the U.S., the roots really come from sort of power movements that, you know, really come from, you know, uh, nations around the world that have practiced philanthropy like this in more communal and collective settings for a very long time. And speaking of the international setting, I just want to bring out um, Nana and Mosun and ask uh, each of you, or maybe both of you, to comment on what have you seen um, in your, among your member networks, uh, practices that, whether it's participatory grant making or other methods to help shift the power dynamics such more towards grantees and those they serve. So I think, uh, I, I mean, uh, Tim, I think one of the things that, uh, at least we've seen that participatory grant making does, or even you know, having collaboratives come together, is it actually gives individual philanthropists or individual foundations more courage to sort of you know, make decisions that they otherwise would not. And uh, especially where in a, in a geography where a lot of uh, philanthropy is, uh, institutional philanthropy, I will say, is new. Um, it's, it's hard for, um, for foundation leaders, especially if they are, you know, um, they've been appointed by families who, who aren't really, who are expecting them to follow a certain path, but yet give this feeling that, you know, the foundation is led by, by a professional who's making those decisions. In being, in being part of a group actually helps that foundation leader to actually have more courage. What we've also seen, which is a recent trend, which I think is really encouraging, is a few collaboratives. So one actually that, that is seeded by Ford Foundation and it'll give in India around, uh, around gender, which has um, the end beneficiaries or the, uh, the recipient organizations that are part of that collaborative and that are part of that collaborative pool of decision-making. And to me, that is the real sort of looking at sharing of power when you can have the uh, beneficiary organization on the same table as the funding organization and that collaborative as a whole then makes a decision in terms of uh, how, you know, how, how are they going to do the grants? Where is it going to go? What are you really looking for? So I think we're seeing a few of those, not as many as, as we should, but at least it's, it's, uh, it's a welcome step in the, in the right direction. Yeah, um, thanks, Tim. I, I think I'll, I'll just piggyback on that. It's it's really we're not seeing a lot of that. I think what we're what we're getting is conversations around it, um, and the need to 
to um, break down the barriers between funders and, um, and, and grantees. Um, interestingly, APF has had, you know, in, 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 in our, our, our last in-person conference, we did have a conversation that brought the donors and the grantees together to have the difficult conversation of, you know, it, it was actually, we gave the power, if I'll put it that way, to the nonprofit, you know, because we wanted, um, it, was, it was a session designed for the donors to hear what the nonprofits had to say um, about their needs um, and how donors could be more supportive of nonprofit organizations. So we're beginning to open up um, that conversation. I'm not seeing any, I don't know of any specific example where there was actually um, that participatory approach to, to grant making. Um, and I think that's why I, I, at this point, I'll touch on the, the research that APF and Britspan are currently engaged in, um, which is focused on unlocking local capital for local nonprofits. Um, because we, from, from previous research by Britspan, it, it, it showed that about just about 9% of, of funding was getting to local nonprofits. Um, they were either funding international or local funding was either going to government or to INGOs. Um, and in the, in, the, in the course of this survey, we did speak with a lot of nonprofit organizations and they shared their frustrations. Um, and the, the goal is to bring them around the table with donors um, as we, share the, the findings of this research um, later in, in the year, possibly in late May or in June, um, so that we can have these conversations and actually get the nonprofits in the process of, of, you know, of grant making decisions by the donors, you know, so that it's more participatory and there is more, um, there is the balance of power is, is you know, adjusted appropriately, if I'll put it that way. Great. Thanks, Mosun. And um, we're coming to a close. So I, I want to give each of the panelists um, 60 seconds um, um, to respond to a, a prompt. And the prompt is based on this, this rich discussion, both, both in the in the larger group and in your breakout sessions, what in particular strikes you? And I want to start with, with Ari. Tim, thank you so much. Uh, you, you know, what, what strikes me uh, in this conversation um, is hope um, uh, amidst a great deal of darkness. So, um, if, we understand at MUSO that our ability to move from patient-centered design uh, work to a national healthcare reform commitment that took over a decade. It took partners that were ready to go in with us uh, with unrestricted commitments for the long term and to not try to dictate how the work looks. Uh, but this is not the norm. White supremacy, the legacy of colonialism still pervades the field. So, uh, just for example, just in the past month, two different funding partners tried to pressure our government partners and MUSO to slash payment to frontline workers. Uh, so that's uh, West African women and men living in poverty at uh, starvation wages, well below minimum wage. Uh, so we all have so much more to do to remove white supremacy from the bones of global health and development, from the bones of philanthropy and from the bones of our own organization. The partners we get to work with and all the people here in this room give me hope that we have the tools to make this change today. And at MUSA, we've got a top 10 list practices that in our experience have driven and can drive transformative impact in philanthropy today can make systemic change for our patients. I'll put that in the chat and we look forward to building this path ahead with all of you um, and grateful for all of your courage and vision. Thank you, Ari, and thank you for what you do and, and for sharing those. Uh, principles in the chat. Um, Nana, to you. What strikes you? 
So I think this this has been an amazing conversation, and I'm so glad I got up at 4 a.m. to join it. So Tim, thank you again for and Heather for for inviting me to be part of it. I mean, I think what strikes me right now is, you know, I think it's it's the time for courage, right? It's not just the time for courage for funders, but it's also the kind time for courage for 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 recipients, for doers. I mean, I think it's important for us that. Funders should have the courage. All of us who are part of funding organizations or funding networks should have the courage to name and oppose the tendencies of those of us that perpetuate injustice, regardless of how much it costs. I think we must, it's the time has come, we must enable, you know, those who are more vulnerable to help shape the solutions that we are all trying to achieve. I think it's, it's also very important for us who work in communities where governments play a role to actually hold governments and government institutions responsible for providing public good. At the same time, I think to the doers in the room, to the, to the, to the founders in the room, I think you also hold a lot of power. And it's, it's you know, many of you, and, and I've been there, I am there, I'm a nonprofit as well. We, we are very worried of saying no to our funders because we are worried that, you know, we have a fear that we will not receive support in the future. But have we ever really thought that we actually hold power? Because funders and philanthropists achieve their means through us. It is what we do that makes them look good. So, you know, it's time for us also to go back and say, we're not going to give you that power. And, you know, we are going to also shape how your money is being spent. So that's that's what I'm going to take away. Thanks, Nina. Mosun, we have to move quickly now too, sorry. <laughs> Great, no problem. Um, I, I think I was just struck by the um, the difficulty that sort of came through in terms of thinking of funders that are supporting systems change in Africa, especially African supporting systems change work in Africa. And so for me, that's what I'm, I'm taking away, the need to really um, crowd in support for change makers that are doing exceptional work and transformational work um, and get African funding behind them. Thank you. Thanks, Mosin. Thank you. And thanks for what you do. Um, Don. Uh, what strikes me is that, uh, first of all, it's my first Skoll World Forum um, participation. Uh, I think I see this as part of a promising trend in which philanthropy is scrutinized uh, and our feet are held to the fire much more than um, I believe it's uh, that than we've seen in the past. Um, and I think the the rise of critics of the sector, um, you know, authors like on Gary Dardas and Rob Reich and other people who've written uh, and Edgar Villanueva uh, in the U.S. context who've written about uh, philanthropy and uh, how we need to be um, more accountable to the public uh, is a very promising sign, and it's really you know, putting pressure on us to uh, demonstrate our worth in terms of our role in society. So uh, I see this conversation as being part of that broader conversation and uh, I welcome it. Thanks, Don. Jen? I think, I think what I'm taking away is it's thrilling to know that you're not alone. It's exciting to be a part of a community. So many of the comments have sort of talked about individual experiences or like kind of how we toil away in our silos and isolated from each other. And yet here we all are across many different time zones um, talking and thinking about the same things. I think we have to do better at finding each other, supporting each other, making more transparent the good work that we are seeing. And, uh, and, and I think that's when, when, you know, philanthropy loves the trend. And if, they, if people feel like they're behind on the trend, they will get on the trend. So let's set the new trend today. Thanks, Jen. Over to you, Heather, take us home. Thanks, Tim. Okay, I just wanna take a minute to thank everyone so much for joining um, uh, and thank uh, the Skoll Foundation for giving us a place to do this session at the Skoll World Forum. I hope that your breakout sessions were as great as mine was, and we're going to collect all the information on the Easy Retro. Tim and I are going to put out a blog after this with some of the highlights. And uh, uh, Edwin O from Skold posted in the chat, and it's here as well, the link to our initiative. Look for more information from us, and we'd love to stay in touch. So that's all. Thank you for hanging in there, and um, good day, good evening, good morning to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.
Bye, everyone. Adios.